Well, good morning and welcome to Calvary Baptist Church, and it is good to be back with you. I have uh, missed everybody, and I know it's been a few weeks since uh, you have seen me, um, and for those that may not know, um, just in case uh, you hadn't heard, uh, I was uh, had a, a uh, cancer diagnosis uh, a few weeks ago, and um, we had to go in and do some surgery and some other things. Um, and I am finally done with my recovery from the surgery, and uh, I'm doing pretty good. Um, still got some tests to make sure that everything has cleared and and all that sort of good stuff. So not uh, not completely done with things yet, but um, the Lord has blessed. And uh, you know, is is I get the opportunity to uh, come back to the pulpit this week and to be with you here online. Um, I want to share with you some lessons I learned in the storm. Um, because, you know, a cancer diagnosis is a scary thing. And there's so many people that go through it. And it is it is one of those things that it is hard to, to wrap your head around. Something that, you know, an illness that could kill you or, or something of that nature. It just, it is, it is, it is a challenge. Um, it can be scary. It can be, um, you know, it can make you have those questions that run through your 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 mind. You know, Lord, why why are you allowing this to happen? All this sort of stuff. And and you know, as a Christian, when you get this type of situation that happens, and this can be uh, anything from from bad medical news to you know having you know we even had something else happen in this. Uh, this past week, uh, we had somebody, um, you know, while I wasn't able to drive, uh, Veronica moved the truck out and she parked it uh, in front of our house and she got the car. She wanted to take the car to work. It's easier for her to to drive and that sort of thing. And uh, while she was at work, somebody uh, hit the the the, tr the truck, and so they they uh, damaged the driver's side door and uh, the insurance company with the gauge and how many miles it was on they totaled it out and and you know now i've got to try to figure out how to get it to uh get it repaired and all this sort of stuff and and it's just you know any of these things can can like hit us and we are going you know why is this lord and, and we can have these these times where we are wondering in the midst of a storm, Lord, why is this? Um, you know, I don't understand. How am I going to fix this? How am I going to? And, and, you know, we can get so worked up and so, you know, all the gears are turning and we get anxiety and we get frustration and we get worry and we get depression and we get all these different things that just sort of pile on us at once. And it can, it can be devastating. And, you know, the thing of it is, is, you know, when we're going through it, we, we sometimes feel like we're the only one that's ever been through this stuff before, or we're, we're the only one who under, and, and the truth is, is this world is fallen and broken. And there's so many people that go through this and Satan loves to make people feel like they're all alone, that no one cares, that God isn't there, that, and, and you know, is, is I get to come to you today. I want to share with you some of the good things that I, I've seen through this these past few weeks and in, in dealing with this diagnosis and coming to terms with it and in, in surgery and all this sort of stuff. And and I also want to share with you some of the places where, where I stumbled or I had to catch myself a little bit because you know the fact of the matter is 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 we are all human. And even even if we know the Lord, even if we have been a solid Christian, you know, there is things that can that can shake us and we, we can we can feel like we're out of control, that the, the ship is 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 being tossed by the sea. And and you know, when we have those moments, we need to understand, okay, how do I deal with this? How do I because you know, if we allow ourselves and we don't stand firm on the things that we know is true, we don't hold to the promises of God, it can shipwreck us. And you know, that that is probably one of Satan's biggest goals in, in this world today is to, one, is to prevent people 
from ever hearing about Jesus, from ever hearing the truth, from ever hearing how much that God truly loves them. And the second thing is to take people who know the Lord and shipwreck their lives and completely make them ineffective for the gospel, to completely make them ineffective for being a, a positive example of the power of God in, in, in the life of a person. And so I want to share with you what, what I've learned because, you know, the great thing about God is, and, and the great thing about having brothers and sisters in the Lord is, is we are to care about each other. We are to love each other. And, and you know, I can think of, of when I was growing up, you know, I have a little sister that's nearly 10 years younger than me, nine and a half years. And, and, you know, one of the things I love to do for my little sister is I love to spoil her. I love to do, you know, nice things. I love, you know, when I was, I was working long before she, ever, you know, she was, you know, just a little kid. And I like to go out and get her things or take her, you know, and take her out after school and take her to movies and, and things like that. And just, just care for her. But I also wanted to do something that was really important is, is the things that I learned in life, the, the lessons that I learned, the, the challenges that I stumbled in, I wanted to share with her the lessons I learned so she wouldn't have to make the same mistakes that I did. And you know, that that's that's something that I think parents love to do for their children. Um, you know, I love to do for my sister um, because the people that we love, we don't want to see them trip and stumble the same places we did in that if somebody can learn from the errors we make or or the lessons that we learned and they don't have to make them themselves it, it, it's it's amazing you know now and I get there's so many times that that people you know it seems like they're they're bound and determined to to fall in their own the their the traps and and do the same things and all this sort of stuff but but you know I want to share with you the the things that I've seen because if it can help you when you have a dark moment in your life, when you are scared or worried or or you feel that pressure or or you feel that at time where you don't know what to do, if this can help you, if this can show you something that God showed me, then it is worth it. You know, I'm not a big big fan of him, um, but every once in a while this guy does come up with something that's that's pretty smart. Warren Buffett said, it's good to learn from your mistakes. It's better to learn from other people's mistakes. And and not to put it so cold, but it truly is. If it's a mistake that we don't have to make and we can learn from it, that's great. I mean, that's what the whole Old Testament is. I mean, we see the the struggles of the people of, of God and how they struggled with sin and how they kept going in these cycles back and forth of trusting God. And then things were great. And then they... They, they let their faith in God wane or they, they, they looked and, oh, this is shiny. Let me, let me go worship this God over here or do this over here. And, and it, it shipwrecked them. It, it, it devastated them. They, they, they abandoned their faith in the Lord. And, you know, while, while the experience I went through is not nearly that serious, it is a situation where we've got to to try to learn and, and not continue to make the same mistakes. And so I hope that uh, our time together today will help you. And as we take a look at what God's word says about dealing with difficult circumstances, you know, when we're, when we're in a, a situation where it seems like one thing's going wrong and we allow ourselves to get caught up in it and, you know, we, we take our eyes off what we know we're supposed to. You know, the number one thing Christians should do is, is put their faith and their trust in the Lord. To trust in the promises of God. And I know we have talked about that so many times. That all things work together for the good of those that love Him and are called according to His purpose. Even difficulties. And, and, you know, it's something that, that I truly believe and I hold on to and I hold to this day, you know, this whole ordeal that I've, I've been through, going through, whatever may come, go through, is meant for my good. And you might be going, how can that be? You know, 
I am, I am praying that this makes me a better pastor. This makes me more empathetic to people that are dealing with, with tragedy in their life and difficulty in their life. But, you know, when we allow ourselves to, to get caught up in something that we shouldn't, it, it's like a, a train that's derailing. You know, that first car that jumps the tracks and then the next and the next and the next and it just turns into this huge, monstrous pile. But, you know, when we think about this, when we think about what God has told us, we have some things that, that God tells us about life. And, and so when we get those, those pieces of news that scare us or they, they, they cause us to worry, you know, we need to remember what God has told us. And, you know, it says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, it tells us this, 2 Timothy chapter 1, and we're going to be in verse 7. It says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. And, and you know, to know these things and to read these things, it, it, it's, but then when you experience something, it is so easy for us to take these truths of God's word and, and to forget them or to to just let the worry build like that train wreck that just keeps piling up on itself. You know, when I got the, the, the diagnosis of cancer, you know, I was, I was scared. I'll be honest with you. I was scared, terrified. You know, yeah, the, the type of cancer I have is one of the most treatable cancers, but it's cancer. You know, the disease that kills so many people that, that so many have struggled with or and spent years with, with treatments and other things and, and, and worry. And, and, you know, it's like uh, thoughts of, oh, you know, Lord, did, have I done what you wanted me to do in my life? You know, ha, have I, have I taught my kids the right way? Have I been a good husband? Have I, you know, all these things just keep piling up in your thoughts and, and it, it's, it's terrifying. It can scare you. And so I had all these things, even though I knew I knew, I trusted the fact that, that God doesn't give us a spirit of fear, but it was just these things kept piling and piling and piling. And so even though I had the promises, I, I, was, I was scared for a moment. I, I was really, I really felt adrift. And, and you know, that is hard. That is really hard. You know, going in and in surgery and, and you know, first week after surgery, you know, I get the results of, of what happened. They said, well, we think we got it all, all this sort of stuff, but the type of cancer it was, was, um, the actual makeup of the cancer isn't particularly a great one. And so they're a little worried about this and that. And, and so, you know, it's, it's like, well, are they, you know, what about this? And what about this? And what about, th and in my mind just raced as I was trying to recover and it just, it wasn't where I needed to be. It wasn't where the Lord wanted me to be. And how about you? I mean, have you had those moments? Have you had those moments where you've had difficulties in your life? You know, maybe you've had family issues where, you know, you've had arguments or, or, or hostilities between family and, and, and it just derails you. Or maybe you've had medical conditions that's derailed you. Or maybe you've had, you know, something that's unexpected happen in your life and you're going... Lord, why is this? And, and, and maybe it has derailed your faith in the Lord. And I want to tell you and, and, and speak with you, say, don't let that happen. Don't allow that to happen. Don't go down that road because that is where Satan wants us. And that is not where the Lord wants us because the Lord wants us to live in victory. Because the, the truth is, is, is this life is temporary. It, it doesn't matter what happens, you know, we, we have no promise of tomorrow. The Lord has our days measured. He has it written in his book. We don't know how long that is. That we, we could live to be 20 years old. We could live to be 120 years old. We don't know. The Lord knows. And we're not going to change anything that the Lord has set for, for our life by worrying about it, by letting ourselves be defeated, by, by allowing anxiety and worry and, and fear eat us up. The only thing we're doing is, is taking 
taking God's plan and we're, we're, we're shifting it over. We're, we're doing our own thing. We're living outside of what God would have us to do because God wants us to step and work through things with him, even the difficulties. You know, if you get that, that, that news that, you know, uh, you're going to lose your job or, or something of that nature, the Lord is there. He wants to walk through it with you. You know, I've been in situations like that where I was told that, you know, hey, I, we're not going to be able to keep you on anymore and, and, and looking for where the Lord would have me to be and all this sort of stuff. And, and I've shared that with you. And, and that, was, that was trying times. But even through the midst of it, even in the midst of the difficulty and, and the, 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 the fear and the, the worry and all this sort of stuff, the Lord was there. He was walking through it step by step with, with me and Veronica, with, with Lucas. And he loved us. He took care of us even in the midst of it. He was there. And so even in the midst of this situation that I've been going through, the Lord has been there and he has been showing himself so faithful. You know, I, I got to say thank you so much for, for Calvary and all the people of Calvary, the ones that's brought us meals, the ones that sent me cards, that, that called me, that sent Facebook messages and, and prayed and all these. You guys have been a huge encouragement to me. And, and it, what a blessing it is to know that you have brothers and sisters in the Lord that care for you. That is awesome. But I want us to take a look at the book of Romans. Because the book of Romans, I, I love the book of Romans. Romans teaches us so much theology. It gives us so much uh, into the how our faith works, what, what we're supposed to do, how we're supposed to live. But... This this passage or these passages we're going to read in Romans, it really is going to speak to us. And I want us to be, I want us to take a look at this. Because to be real honest, when I was, when I freaked out, when I was worrying, when I was upset about what I was going through, when I was, you know, unsure of, okay, what's going to happen? What's, to be real honest, I was sinning. To, and you might go, oh! Yeah, because it wasn't my spot. That wasn't my place. I can't change anything. The Lord has it mapped out. He says, trust him to put our faith in him and trust. And so, yeah, when, when we're in those situations, we can feel that, that anxiety, that pressure, but he tells us to trust him. And I want us to take a look at what God's word says, because I think we'll see exactly that, that the Lord tells us to put our faith in him, to, to follow him, and to, to depend upon him. So let's start, we're going to be in Romans chapter 6, starting verse 1. See what God's word has to say to us. It says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so uh, we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been united together in likeness of his death, certainly we also it to be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might drone away or, or dr be drawn uh, done away with, pardon me, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life they lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you shall obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as an instrument of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Now, 
you might be going, what way, when am I supposed to be hearing through this? You know, we, if we have given our heart to the Lord, if we have asked him to forgive us of our sins, if we are Christians, we are no longer following the old path, the sinful life, the one that leads to death. Sin's end result leads to death. You know, when we don't trust God, when we are living in opposition to him, when we that that life is going to bring nothing but death and destruction. And not only is it going to bring physical death and destruction, it's it's spiritual death and destruction. You know, that is the way that humanity finds itself is it finds itself starting out life dead. We're we're dead because of sin. And because of what he did on the cross, his death, burial, his resurrection, he he walks in newness of life. We we are we are joining ourselves together with him. That's that's what that's what we do when we we ask Jesus to forgive us of our sins. When we ask Him to be our Savior, we are joining ourselves with Him. That is when we when we are baptized. If we're baptized, that is what we're doing. Is we're saying we are linking ourselves to Jesus. We are, and, and that's why we we don't go under the water, back up, full immersion. It's symbolizing our our death to the old life, and our our rising again to walk a new life. In this new life, we don't, we are no longer beholden unto sin. We are no longer bound by it. You know, sin is is you know freaking out when we hear bad news that we 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 have no faith that God can take care of things that that he he's got this. That there's a plan behind this to to let ourselves be bound up in anxiety and worry and in and, and fear and you know these are these are things that, that God does not want for us. And you know is 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 we you know we have asked the Lord to forgive us our sins. He has given us where we can have victory over that life. We can have victory over sinfulness. We can have victory over fear and, and all these things. And you know the thing of it is, is he did it so we wouldn't have to walk like we did before, that we wouldn't have to be uh, let sin reign in our mortal bodies anymore, that we can let glory and righteousness reign, that we could live a life that honors God. You know, here's the thing that I, I noticed, and it's kind of amazing, is, you know, Veronica said she's never seen me uh, drunk because, you know, I don't drink, but... She thought it was interesting because, you know, they had me a whole bunch of painkillers and, and anesthesia and all this sort of stuff. And, and you know, one of my, my biggest things is I said, Lord, help me to be a good example. Help me to, to shine your light no matter when, when I'm squeezed. Help me, help me in my darkest times to, to shine for you. And I, I don't remember it, but, I, but the nurses came in and and they said when I woke up for anesthesia, I was praying for the nurses and thankful for them. And and you know, I'm I am so thankful to the Lord that when I don't remember how I was acting, when just who I am was was coming out, and I really didn't have a lot of control about it, is I was praying for people and I was I was thanking them and and, and that's. When I was in a situation, I wasn't, you know, mad or angry or hostile or, you know, oh, woe is me. I am thankful that when I was in that situation, good things came out. And that's, that's what we need to have. We need to have that, that, that dominion of, of God's grace. We need, we need to be under grace and let him rule in our lives. But you know when I when I let myself start to worry and start to fear and to fret, I was I was turning myself over to the old ways. And and it was it was so easy just to to get in this dark hole. It was so easy to be there. But that's not what he wants. He wants us to be dead to sin. He doesn't want us to live in those situations anymore. And so when we have, you know, maybe we we before we were you know, had addictions. We were maybe we were an alcoholic, or, or you know, we had this, or we had that, or we had 
you know, maybe we were gossip or something, and, and the Lord can set us free from those things. We don't have to keep going back to these old sins any longer. We don't have to keep following them. Let's keep reading. Verse 15, what then sh shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that you were slaves to sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered, and having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh, for just as you have presented your members as slaves of uncleanliness and of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For you, when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard of righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and to the end everlasting life for the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord you know one of the things that that the situation that I've been going through is giving me the opportunity is the Lord has been putting me in contact with a whole bunch of people that I'd never have contact with doctors nurses even people that I spend time with I, I've got to, it's that relationship has been in a different light, knowing that I'm going through a struggle. And you know, what's amazing is, is when we, when we allow ourselves to, to fall into the old patterns, do like everyone else does to, to get in that scared and worried and fearful to, to fall into these things rather than, than turning it over to the Lord and trusting him. We, we miss out on, on what God can do because, you know, I get to have the opportunity to speak with people. One of the, one of the neat things is um, my doctor my doctor has a specific nurse. And, you know, me and Veronica sort of came to the conclusion, you know, we, we don't think she has really knows anything about the Lord at all. And now I'm going to, you know, if everything comes back good, I'm going to be on this maintenance program where they're going to be doing tests and screens and stuff over the next several years, I'm going to have the opportunity to to talk to this lady probably for the next several years, multiple times, you know, four or five times at least a year. You know, that is that is awesome that I can maybe try to to speak some truth into her life and and tell her about Jesus. You know that that is that is awesome. I'm looking forward to that opportunity. I hope that I will, Lord will give me the words to say so I can be an example to those that, that I have contact with. And I hope that that's what, what you see too. You know, you might have those situations, but how you respond to those situations is, is going to be such an awesome thing. You know, Joshua, when, when at the end of, of the book of Joshua, he was, talking about how he was, you know, choose who you're going to serve. Either serve the Lord and, and, and reap all these blessings that he has promised and all these things that he has done, or go back and serve the other gods. And, you know, we have those choices. Are we going to serve the old way, our old life, fall into the old patterns? Or are we going to follow the Lord and do what he would have us to do? You know, who are we going to allow, are, are we going to go right back to what the Lord has saved us from and, and keep falling into the old patterns, the old ways, the, the old sins that feel comfortable to us? We, we've got to let those go. We've got to make, put ourselves in, and says, you know, he's talking about trying to make an example that they would understand, you know, putting ourselves as a, as a slave to righteousness for, 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 for holiness, for, for great things to happen. And so we need to understand that we've got to give our life to the Lord, that we need to, uh, when we are faced with these trials, that we respond how the Lord would have us to respond. Not what feels comfortable, not what comes naturally to us, because we're naturally broken. 
you know, Stephen Covey, a, a, a guy who is who is synonymous with, you know, success and all this sort of stuff, he, he gave this quote. He says, we cannot always choose what happens to us, but we can choose our responses. And, and you know, that's what we have to do. You know, through through this, this situation, you know, getting a, a diagnosis of cancer, that was scary. But, you know, I look at things and it's Lord, Lord's got a plan for this. He's got a purpose. And I can either sit there and worry and wring my hands, which isn't going to help anything. If anything, I'm going to be nervous. I'm going to not feel good. I'm going to be worried. I'm going to lose out on, on things. I'm not going to be the example I need to be because, you know, what example is it when you see somebody who is, is a person of faith come in and they are, they are just scared and worried and anxious and, and all this sort of stuff, or that person, even in the midst of, of something that is scary, comes in and they have trust and they have faith that the Lord is with them no matter what the outcome is. Which one makes an impact? You know, we can make a negative impact for the kingdom, or we can make a positive impact for the kingdom. And I hope that you are like me, and you want to make a positive impact for the kingdom. We want to see God lifted high. And you know, this is this, these are the things I've been learning. That we are responsible for our choices. We're responsible for how we respond. And are we going to respond in a way that lifts God up, that, that glorifies our Savior, that, that says, hey, I have faith, and this is real. This isn't just, you know, bandwagon type stuff. You know, football playoff time is is kind of here, and we're seeing all the teams and all this sort of stuff. And, and uh, you know, I have a lot of friends and family in Cincinnati, and I don't know how the game's going to go this weekend or whatever and all this sort of stuff, and I won't even predict it and probably won't watch it. But, you know, everybody in my family from over in Cincinnati, they're – they're all going bananas because we haven't seen Cincinnati win a playoff game in who knows how many years. And now they're in the the, the championship game. And, and then if they win that, they'll be going to the Super Bowl and all this sort of stuff. You know, you can be a, a bandwagon fan. You can, oh, everything's going great. Let's, let's go over here. Let's hop on here. Or you can be a fan that sticks for a long time. You can be a fan that sticks when... Your team stinks or, or things don't go well and all this sort of stuff. And, and you know, that's kind of how it is with, with our relationship with the Lord. Are we only going to trust in God? Are we only going to be a Christian when, when things are great? Or do we trust him when, when things are difficult? You know, he said in this life we would have trouble, that, but we could take heart. He has overcome the world. There is going to be difficulty in our life. It is something I can guarantee to you, I can promise to you, now maybe you you know pray, uh, pray that that you never have to to have a cancer diagnosis. I pray that you never have uh, you know a, a loss of a loved one that was was too soon or sudden or unprepared. You know I pray that you don't have anything that's catastrophic for financial you know losing a job or anything like that. But we are going to have difficult times in our life. It's going to happen at some point in time. How are we going to respond? You know, I, I found a meme, and, and, and it goes with the saying. You, many of you have probably heard the, the old story about the two wolves. You know, the, there's a battle of two wolves inside, but, but it does it different. And I want to read this to you. It says, there's a battle of two wolves inside all Christians. One is sin. The other is God. The wolf that wins, God. And that really should be our goal, is to never let sin conquer us. Jesus died to make us more than conquerors. He died so we would not have to be victim to, to chaos. You know, let me read you chapter 7, because it, it, it's, it is so important. And that, that's why I love Romans, is he goes from talking about you know, dead to sin, alive to God. But then he talks about this. So chapter 7, starting verse 1. Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak of those who know the law, that the law has dominion over man as long as it lives. For the woman who has a husband is bound by law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. 
And so then if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is freed from that law. So she is no longer, she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. Therefore, my brethren, you have also become dead to the law through the body of Christ. That you may be married to another, to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. But now we have been delivered uh, from the law, having died to what we're held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I have not known covetousness unless the law said, You shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which uh, was to bring me a life, I found to bring death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. Therefore the law is holy, and commandment holy, and just, and good. Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me, What uh, though what was good, so that sin uh, through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing I do not understand. For what I, I will to do I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not uh, will not to do... Uh, I agree with the law that it is good, but now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, is nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now if I do what I, I will not to do, is not longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin." So what is Paul telling us? He's, he's telling us that the, the very thing that helps us know that we are doing wrong is, is the thing that, that causes sort of law, uh, sin to, to grow. You know, we have a rebellious spirit. It really is what it comes down to. You know, the best example I can give to this is, is Johanna. You know, Johanna... Uh, my mom and dad took the girls for a couple of weeks while I was recovering. So because, you know, I, I have weight restrictions and I had stitches that were healing and all this sort of stuff. And they didn't want the, the girls to be jumping on me and all this sort of thing. But, you know, my mom found something. She hasn't been around a two-year-old for a long period of time for decades. <laughs> and and so JoJo is in those terrible twos. And, and, you know, my mom would tell her, don't do this, JoJo. And she would... Jojo would smile and she would go and do exactly what my mom told her not to do. Now you'd go, surely not, surely not, precious Jojo. Yes, she is a troublemaker. But, you know, she knew that she was causing problems. She knew that what she was doing is wrong. And yes, she got disciplined for it and she was told, don't do that. And she, she had timeouts and other things and all this sort of stuff. I told my mom, that's okay. You need to do that. You need to... Make sure that she understands when she's doing it. It's not cute. It's not funny. But you know, the thing of it is, is we tend to do that in our own selves. You know, we have, in this world, we have this huge thing with with gender and stuff. I mean, even even the, the very basic of what is a man, what is a woman, we, our world is, is conflicted and un, can't understand and is all confused about. And this is the very, you know, the very, one of the very basic things that God put in humanity. You know, this is this is you know one of the very most basic things, and yet people are are because 
they don't want to give into the fact that, that God has ordained a, a pattern in a way that things should work. And, and so, you know, this very act of rebelling against the very uh, nature of humanity is, is what's in that sinful nature to, to constantly rebel. You know, uh, we know it's, we, we shouldn't be gossiping about each other, but you know, you get on Facebook and people are trolling and, and saying horrible, evil things. And they, they say it because, well, this is anonymous and they can't actually see me or they can't do this. Or, or may, maybe we, we struggle with, with gossip and, you know, oh, I'm just telling the truth. I'm just, I'm just telling you what I heard, you know, but do we, you know, as Christians, do we say, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear the scoop or the news or what about that. I don't want to hear that stuff. That, that isn't, that isn't wholesome. That isn't uplifting. No, we, 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 that rebellious nature seems to call to us sometimes. You know, when we, when we have rage or anger and, but, but they're doing wrong or they're doing evil and, and we, we've got to, a yes, what, what they're doing is wrong, but, but God has called us to love other people. You know, how are we going to, are we going to see people come to the kingdom through hating or are we going to see them coming through through love? That, that even though we disagree with them, even though we think they're wrong, even though we don't support what decisions they're making, that we still care for them and love them and, 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 and share with them that God loves them and God wants to forgive them and has a better plan and a better way for them. You know, we are, we are in this, this trap and, you know, I love this chapter and, and I hope that, that you get this as you read chapter seven of Romans here is, is Paul is saying, you know, I'm, I, I want to do good, but I'm doing evil. I, I, I'm, I feel trapped. And you know, when we try to do things on our own, when we try to do it in our own power and we aren't constantly giving it to the Lord and asking for forgiveness and, and, and seeking his, his wisdom and his blessing and his guidance, when we try to do it, on our, we're, we are going to fall into the old habits because, you know, we are not perfected on this side of eternity. We are going to struggle with the sinful nature that wants to lead us down the wrong path. You know, that, that's, that's why, you know, when, I, when you hear the, the, the diagnosis that you don't want to hear, you know, the first thing is fear and worry, and, and it hits you like a ton of bricks. And so the people that, that that's, you know, the first reaction they have, that's natural. But that isn't what the Lord wants from us. He, he doesn't want to leave us there. He doesn't want to leave us in fear and panic. He wants us to trust him. He wants us to, to come to him and say, Lord, I, I, I don't know what to do. I need you. You know, even when we are in our weakest spot, you know, when we're in our weakest place, when we are coming to God and saying, Lord, I need you. That is what the Lord wants from us. He knows that we're weak. He knows that we're frail. He knows that we have we struggle. You know, the what 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 Paul is trying to tell them here is is you know the law and all the things that we're supposed to do and, and not supposed to do, you know, that is not going to save us. That is not going to to give keep us from sin. That that's the whole purpose of the law was to show us that we can't do it on our own that we need a savior. It was pointing towards Jesus the whole time. You know, there is no way that we're ever going to be redeemed by the law because the very the very human nature that we have is a rebellious spirit. And so we know this isn't the thing to do. Our brain tries to figure out loopholes and and this, that, and whatever. You know, it, it's it's amazing. Well, it isn't really sin if I do this, or it isn't really sin if I only go this far, or it isn't really, you know, Kids love to do that. You know, even when you get a kid to understand that what they're doing is not right and that it's it's got the natural thing or the next step is, okay, I know this line is something I shouldn't cross. How close can I get to that line without, how, how can I, how can I narrow up here? And it's, it's, how close can I get? I'm not touching it. I'm not touching it. It's that rebellious human nature. 
And it's that, that normal reaction that we have and that thing that we have to fight against. And as, as Christians, it's something that we're still going to struggle with. Now, yeah, I didn't, I didn't have the best response at first to when I got the diagnosis that I did. And you might be going, well, I didn't see that. I'm, if you didn't see that, I'm glad. But these are the lessons that I had to learn. You know, these were the things that, you know, I, me at home praying and asking the Lord and, and having others pray with me and being there with Veronica. And so these are the struggles that I went through. And, you know, these are the struggles that we can go through. But God has something better. And so he doesn't want to leave us in this trap of who can save me, who can rescue me. The, because we don't have just the law. We have the Messiah that's come, the one, promised one. And I want to show you what, what he does from us. That he frees us and he gives us the ability to conquer. Romans 8, starting verse 1, says, now There is therefore now no condemnation to those common or condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law may be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity with God, for it is not the subject of law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is not in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. And so it is, it is the fact that Jesus died and, and gave himself for us, that he transferred his perfect life of righteousness for, for our life of sin. He, he basically exchanged lives with us. He says, here, I'm counting this towards you. And it's our faith that, that we can be alive in that, that, that life in the Spirit. We are no longer bound. We can have victory. We don't, we don't have to wallow. When, when, you know, if, if... Here's, here's the thing that I discovered is the Lord of all creation who loves me enough to send his son to die for me, who has a plan and a purpose for my life. He, he has allowed me to go through this. He has ordained it to happen. I trust in the promise that it's for my good and for my benefit, for his glory, and that I can trust him. That no matter what, he's there with me to guide me, to direct me, that he has a purpose for this. You know, all the difficulties in my life. You know, the, all, the difficulties I've seen in my life, I, I hated them the time I was going through them. They scared me. They worried me. But you know, as I've seen, God was walking through it with me. He meant it for a positive. You know, there hasn't been a trial or a tribulation in my life that hasn't brought blessing. You might be going, how can it bring... Because it's prepared me to, to help someone else. It is it has shown me something more of God's character is deep in my relationship with him. It has made me closer to him. It has helped me to see that that what I thought maybe wasn't right. And you know, that's what happens when we're in those storms of life. The Lord grows us. He helps us. And so even though we, we are dead to sin, we are dead to the old way of life, we are alive in Christ and we can do something different. We can be better. We can overcome the things that would always overcome us before. Let me keep reading here. Verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. 
For as many are led by the Spirit of God, those are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God and children than heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we also may be glorified together. For I consider the su that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself will also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains and from together until now. Not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one hope? Uh, for why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness, for we do not know what we should pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows that the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for the good of those that love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, those he also called, and those he called, he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. What then shall we say of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us, how shall he, go, he, not, be, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Whom shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is also at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ. Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all those things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what is all this? How does this all fit together? Well, this is what the glorious thing is, is that God loves us. There is nothing in this life, nothing in this physical life that separates us from God's love. How much he cares for us, that he has made us a joint heir with Jesus. This life is boot camp, like I've said so many times. And boot camp is not easy. We're going to have difficult times. But this is not the end. This is not the end. This isn't the end all be all. He didn't promise us health and wealth and safety and security in this life. He promised us that we would have life everlasting with him, that he loves us, he will walk through it with us, that all things are worked together for the glory of God and, and for those that love God and are called according to his purpose. And so we can trust in these things. We can depend in them. We, we, can, we can hold on to them fast. We know the hope of salvation. We know that he is, he is there with us. That death is not something to be frightened of, but, but it is, it is a, a coming into his very near presence. You know, when, when we look at these things, the Lord said that he is there for us, that, that there is nothing that is going to separate us. Tribulation or distress or persecution, famine or nakedness or peril or sword, none of these things separate us from God. And if we have God, what else do we need? If he is for us, who can be against us? What can happen in this world? We could die. But we have the promise of eternity. We will live forevermore. Where there will be no more 
fear, no more pain, no more struggle, no more strife. That the worst case scenario is the best case scenario. You know, if if the Lord chooses to, to give me problems where I don't make it through, that means I go to be with Him. If, you know, I don't make it through this week because of, you know, I get run over by a bus or something, if I know the Lord, I am secure. You know, this is, this is something that you can rest in, that you can go, you know, we don't have to have anxiety over our life or what's going to happen or how we're going, that the Lord has this. If we seek first the kingdom, he says he adds all these things. The Lord loves me and cares for me. And so he's got this whole situation. He has whatever situation you find yourself going through. He is there. He will get you through it. We have the ability to do something that other people don't. We have the ability to trust and to hold on to and to, to have this hope. But those that don't know the Lord as their Lord and Savior, that those that don't know Jesus, they don't have that hope. And so all they see is despair. You see struggle and strife and hopelessness. And so that's, that's why we have to go and be the example. We have to share with them the good news because there is hope. They don't have to live in hopelessness. They don't have to live with, without any, any joy or peace in their life. There is, there is a way, even in the darkest of times. And so this last, last thing, if I can boil everything I've learned through this storm, into something quick and easy for you to write. It's these two points. One, that God is our refuge through any storm, any trial. However, that doesn't mean he will never lead us into a difficult or dangerous situation. And so when we find a difficult or dangerous situation, we don't, don't get mad at God. Don't go, how could you? Because he, he, he said this life there, we're going to have difficulty. But that even through the storm, he is Lord. He's in control. He's got this. And so if you're going through a difficult situation, let me pass on the one thing that the Lord has taught me. Is don't let yourself grow despaired. Don't, don't, don't worry. Don't fear. And that I know that might be harder to or easier to say than do. Because the natural reaction is when we're in, in distress and into is, is to worry and to fear and to let all that stuff just build and consume us. But if you're saved, we have a Savior that doesn't want to leave us there. He didn't give us a spirit of fear. He gave us a spirit of love and of a sound mind. What a, what a promise that is. That even in the midst of chaos and confusion, we can be at peace we can have a, a we can have a rock to hold on to when when the waves are pounding and we, we can have solid ground under our feet. And this is what I've learned. This is what I've seen in action. It's one thing to preach about something God's word says and to say, yeah, he promises this. It's another thing to experience it and to see it. And this is what I can tell you is that God is Lord of the storm. And I hope that when you go through that storm, you will trust Him and you will depend on Him. Don't let your heart grow troubled. Don't let yourself grow weary. Throw your cares on Him because He cares for you. Well, thank you so much for being with us. I know this has went a little long, but I hope this is a help to you. If you ever find yourself in this, this position, if you ever find yourself in a situation where you are just beyond what you know to do, trust Him. Give Jesus control. Give your worries and cares to Him. He will bring you peace that will surpass all understanding. That is a promise, and I can assuredly tell you it is real. Well, thank you so much for listening. God bless you all. And we'll look forward to seeing you next week.